going to cover four of the reproductive diagrams uh, dealing with female anatomy. We're going to start on page 299 at the bottom, and what you should see is a basic overview uh, from a front view. So let's label the major structures to get started. So first, uh, this top one here is pointing to this entire structure here in the middle, that is the uterus. It is also sometimes referred to as the womb, uh, but usually only when someone is pregnant. At that point, uh, right now normally this is anatomically called the uterus. Uh, connecting the uterus, we have a tube right here. This goes by several names. The most common is the fallopian tubes. But you'll also see uterine tube or oviduct. Oviduct is more commonly used in non-human animals, uh, but you will see it in humans also. Now, right by this here, we see the ovary, which of course is where the eggs are produced. Uh, women are born with all the ovaries they will ever have uh, in a premature state. And then each month, typically one comes to maturity, is released from the ovary, gets into the fallopian tube, travels through the fallopian tube, and makes its way to the uterus. And so we'll talk more about fertilization and pregnancy later. Uh, from the uterus, as we come down, the next area beneath that is the vagina, which is an internal tube, uh, typically three to four inches in length. The boundary between the vagina and the uterus is the cervix. A lot of times this will be called the cervix of the uterus, because we also know that we have that term cervical, meaning neck vertebrae. So this is simply a situation where you have to know context. Obviously here, when we're talking about cervical for reproduction, we're talking about this region. Someone has cervical cancer, it's in this area. A pap smear, which is going to test for cells, is going to come from this area as well. Externally, we have the external genitalia. So this is going to be the labia. Technically, the word labia only means lips. So you will sometimes see the lips on a person's face, also referred to as labia. But most commonly, that term is reserved uh, to mean the folds of skin that make up the external genitalia. Okay, so that gives us a nice overview. Now we're going to go down, and we're going to look at an inferior view. So now in your notebook, this is page 300. And um, <clears throat> right here, this is the anterior of the body. Down here is the posterior of the body. So on the anterior, overlying the pubic bone, there is some fatty tissue, and after puberty, sometimes this becomes a little bit of a swelling. So this is called the mons pubis, which literally means the mountain on the pubis or pubic bone. And that is where a lot of times you will see as a secondary sex characteristic pubic hair forming. Uh, here on this outer border, this is again the labia majora. So again, these are the external genitalia or skin folds. And in this case, they have been spread apart so you can see the structures that are lying underneath. Uh, normally, these would not be visible without moving aside the external skin folds. So this one here is going to be labia minora. Labia majora can have pubic hair on it is a secondary sex characteristic. Labia minora is more delicate, smaller, and typically does not contain hair. This structure right here is the clitoris or clitoris. It is analogous to the tip of the male's penis. It, re 
it includes the highest concentration of nerve fibers in the body. And normally it is under a fold of skin called a prepuce, which is the same thing that the tip of the penis was covered in. In the male, that was called foreskin or prepuce. Uh, here, this sort of hooded area often covers the clitoris. Looking at uh, this entire region, uh, there's sort of a diamond-shaped area that goes uh, from the external genitalia down to the anus. That is called the perineum. So sometimes this whole area is referred to that. The area enclosed within the labia minora is also sometimes called the vestibule. And what that's referring to is enclosing the different orifices. And an orifice then, of course, would be an opening into a tube-like structure. So looking at those orifices, the first one here is the urethral orifice. And so what is that? That is the opening of the urethra for urination. Going down, the next uh, opening here is the vag um, vaginal orifice. So the vagina is actually an internal structure that you really can't um, see except for the opening. And so that would be its orifice. And then down here, this opening would be the anus. So the last thing we have to label here is there is a mucosa fold that partially encloses the vaginal orifice, and that is referred to as the hymen. It is um, often durable, and it is vascular. And so this is the structure that often, when someone has intercourse for the first time, can be torn and can lead to some bleeding. Moving down to the next diagram. So now we are looking at a side view of internal structures. So this is, here is the front of the body. So this is anterior to my right and posterior to the left. And what we're looking at right here, again, is uh, back to page 299. So right here in orange, this one's been color-coded a little bit just to make some of these stand out. And this orangish color here, that is the ovary. We're going to see in more detail in our final diagram in just a few moments. Now, the ovary looks like it is in contact with this next structure. In reality, there is a very small gap. So it sort of forms a funnel end called an infundibulum, but it's not actually in contact with the ovary. So when the egg is ovulated or released as a secondary oocyte, it has to be swept into this uh, funnel end or infundibulum. That end has some folds on it that are finger-like projections. Those are called fimbriae. And they sort of oscillate or create a waving motion that actually creates a little bit of current in the fluid surrounding this structure so that the ovary, because it does not have a tail or flagella like a sperm would, uh, it can't actively swim. So it has to be swept on this current into this tube. So then, of course, this tube again is the fallopian tube, which again we also call the oviduct or the uterine tube. The um, secondary oocyte, once it gets in here, is really propelled uh, over the course of um, about three days to go down this length and then reach the uterus where it's released. It's propelled by rhythmic contractions, which would be peristalsis, and this is actually lined with cilia. And so those cilia are beating and they're moving that egg down. It is actually here uh, where the sperm has to fertilize it. 
So the penis is inserted in the vagina, sperm is released, it has to make it through the cervix, into the uterus, it has to make its way through the uterus, into the fallopian tube, and it has to make its way to the fallopian tube to join with that egg to actually get fertilization. The fertilized egg then begins to develop actually in the fallopian tube. And as it's dividing and beginning development, it'll come down into the uterus where it'll actually uh, wait for implantation. And then it's going to have to implant on this inner lining of the uterus. So let's label a couple of these structures. So in yellow here, this is actually just the uterus in general. Now really, the uterus has three layers to it. Um, we've seen this with many other organs this year. The middle layer is a muscular layer. So that term that we used a lot for muscular was myo. So this is the myometrium. And it is what is actually going to be the muscular layer that is going to be responsible for contractions to eventually deliver the baby during labor. Now, the inner lining, again, one of our words for inner this year has always been endo. This is the endometrium. The endometrium is where the uh, fertilized egg will implant. If it's going to implant, at that point, that is considered a pregnancy. Until you have implantation, even if you have fertilization, under technical terms, this is not considered a pregnancy yet. Um, if the egg is not fertilized, the endometrium is still preparing for that possibility. So this is the inner lining of the uterus that develops, and then eventually it will break down, go through spasms, and be released as the menses, uh, which is more commonly called the period. And we will talk about the menstrual cycle at another time. Now, right here again, at the end of this, we have that junction. So that is the cervix. And then in this light green, this is just to highlight the tube. That is the vagina. Sometimes this is referred to as the birth canal, but pretty much that term is only used when someone is giving birth or about to give birth. Now we can see some other structures that have been already labeled for us. Here is the sacrum. So down here is to be the coccyx or the tailbone. These are uh, the large intestine. So this is the end of the colon. So right here is the rectum and then the anus leaving the body. To the front here, we have the urinary bladder and then the urethra coming down. So earlier when we labeled the inferior view, the first orifice was the urethral orifice, then the vaginal orifice, and then the anus. Notice that the uh, uterus is sort of between these two structures. And initially, um, in a woman who's never been pregnant, it's about the size of a pear. This is going to grow dramatically with a pregnancy, and it's going to push upward, it's going to push out, and it's going to push forward. So often this crowds the bladder, minimizing its ability to fill, making a woman who is uh, pregnant, especially in later term pregnancy, um, having to urinate more frequently or sometimes being incontinent. And then sometimes it can push on the intestines, which actually can contribute to constipation, although some of these other things are also hormonal. Uh, the uterus, as it pushes up, we're also going to see can cause some respiratory issues, put pressure on blood vessels. So it does put the body under a great deal of stress. To the front here, this is the pubic symphysis, where the two hip bones are going to come together. So beneath it here, this structure again is the clitoris. Now the uterus and the ovaries are not um, simply floating around. They are wrapped in connective tissue. So we have 
uh, visceral and parietal layers typically, but we also have ligaments internally. So we have suspensory ligaments, broad ligament, and this one here um, that they're showing is called the round ligament. And that completes this diagram. So moving down, we have one more to look at. This is an ovary, and what it's showing are the stages of development from an immature egg to the point that it is released or ovulated. So over here, what they're showing are some primary follicles. As you've seen in the notes, and we're going to cover further, uh, the follicles are a type of cell grouping that actually surround um, the immature eggs. So that is not the the follicle itself is not an egg. It is a structure that contains what is going to be released as a secondary oocyte. So typically each month, only one of these is going to develop. Uh, multiple could, because it's certainly ha possible to have uh, twins or triplets. Uh, fertility drugs may also sometimes cause these to be released more frequently, uh, or I should say more of them come to maturity. So let's say in this example, only one is going to come to maturity. As it develops here, the cell type surrounding this here is called granulosa. So that is the specific cell type that they're indicating here. But this entire structure um, is now called a vesicular follicle. In other words, one that is coming to maturity. Another term for this is a graphene follicle. It is filling with a fluid. This hollow cavity filling with fluid is called an antrum. Now we can see that there are some different cell layers here, but right here is that uh, what's going to be the secondary oocyte. So eventually it works its way to the surface of the ovary, fuses with it, and ruptures. And so what it's doing is releasing right here a secondary oocyte. Things go. Um, as they should, this is what is going to get picked up and transported on that fluid current into the fallopian tube where it has the possibility of becoming fertilized. The follicle is left behind, and so this right here is just a ruptured follicle. Sometimes it's called an ovulated follicle. Here it says event A, the process, the physiological function that occurred right here, that was ovulation. Basically occurs on day 14 of a textbook perfect menstrual cycle, um, which is considered 28 days. Those can vary greatly. A uh, woman's personal cycle could be 21 days, it could be 28 days, it could be 40 days or anything in between, and there are other situations as well. So when we talk about these in the notes and together, we're really talking in a textbook generalized way. Uh, but ovulation is pretty uh, consistent to be 14 days. Now, this has gone on to either be fertilized or not fertilized. What's left behind was that follicle, which closes up, and it actually transforms into a new structure, which is literally yellow in appearance. So this is called a yellow body, or corpus, meaning body, and luteum, referring to the color yellow in this case. This becomes a glandular tissue that is going to create progesterone. So we know that the ovary makes estrogen and progesterone, this is one of the things responsible for progesterone. There are four fundamental hormones that have to be considered when looking at the menstrual cycle. Follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone we discussed during the endocrine system being released um, really in 
in a gland in the brain. Then we talked about estrogen and progesterone being in the ovary. So we will talk about those four hormones and the role they play in this whole process later in the notes.